<laughs> Welcome everybody. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Uh, Brother Jeff Lynch is here tonight, and we thank him very much um, for uh, leading us tonight, and we look forward to his study. We'll hand over now to Brother Jeff, and we will commence him to his study tonight with you. Um, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So it's that top bit there. Okay. Now, I've got to, sorry, get back to my, there we go. So up the top there mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. title. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me along, by the way. Whoops. Uh, yes, so, again, thank you. I'll go back to the start. Thanks again. It's a pleasure to be with you all and to it's always a lovely thing, I believe, to get together and talk about the Bible. It's something that means a lot to me and uh, I find a lot of encouragement by uh, the interaction that's engaged in when we discuss things about the Bible. So uh, feel free to put um, some comments in as we go if you've got something to add. But our study is a series of three nights and it's about really the, the rebirth or the, the scriptural term is the resurrection of the state of Israel. And it's a fascinating story. It's, it sort of unfolds over a century or so as you can sort of see little hints of God at work uh, around uh, the, the nation of Israel and the Jews and amongst the nations at large to bring about his purpose. So we're going to look in study one, that's tonight, we're going to look at Zionism and the period of the fishes. So this, this is a quote from uh, Jeremiah 16, the fishes and the hunters you'd be familiar with, I gather. Uh, that's where that term comes from. So it was a period, as we'll see, where um, the Jews were being enticed to go back to the land, um, but by and large that uh, didn't attract them. Study two is um, we'll look at the, uh, the hunters, which is also a quote from Jeremiah 16, verse 16. We'll look at the period of the hunters and the most amazing prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones. The detail in that prophecy is incredible. And um, to sort of whet your appetite on that, a lot of people read Ezekiel 37 and see that it's, it talks about the whole house of Israel and they say, well, has it really happened? Has any fulfilment happened? And we'll see that the, the vision that follows immediately after the Valley of the Dry Bones answers that question, that there's actually two stages in the resurrection, the joining of the two sticks. So we'll explore that prophecy in Ezekiel and hopefully that will give us a bit of meaning to this um, Valley of Dry Bones prophecy. And then our final study will take a step back and look at the sign and the wonder that has occurred before everyone's eyes. We're going to look at the Exodus um, and the covenant. I'll leave you in suspense to guess what that one is about. All right, so as I said, tonight's study, it's not a going to be super long so you can breathe a sigh of relief there it's about the fishes and the period of zionism and the things that came together over the period of the 1800s and uh, and so forth that really brought about the momentum for the jewish state and we'll take it up to the period of world war ii so jeremiah 16 if you want to have a look at that in your bible um Some people question Jeremiah 16 and say, well, is, is it really a latter-day prophecy? Some people argue quite definitely that they think, oh, it was really fulfilled in the exile of the Babel into Babylon and the return and, you know, Haman really fulfilled the role of the hunter that sort of 
uh, worked in driving the Jews out of Persia to go back to the land. And there could well be a fulfilment in that, but hopefully you'll see uh, that this clearly has an application in our day. And here we are in Jeremiah 16, and there's the quote um, up there for you. So verse 14 starts this little section, and it says, Therefore, behold, the days come. Now, that's always a little clue. When it talks about the days coming, this is sort of the latter day sort of language. And this gives us a little clue that it's really speaking about uh, it, it could have had a primarily fulfilment back in uh, the, the Persian Empire time, but it certainly has application to these latter days. Um, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Sorry, sorry, I better go back. Let's start again. Therefore, behold, the Lord, the last, sorry, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said. The Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he has driven them, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. So you can see the prophet here is paralleling this exodus with the first exodus out of Egypt when the whole nation came back to the land. And in our second study, we'll sort of look at this. There's actually a couple of stages to all the Jews coming back to the land. And we certainly have seen uh, the initial stage happen. Okay. And uh, then we come to um, verse 15. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he has driven them, and I'll bring them again into the land that I gave unto their fathers. And then we have this famous verse, which if you haven't got it marked in your Bible, I recommend you do because this is incredible. Behold, I will send for many fishes, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And now notice this, there's no if or but here. It is going to be a natural progression that will happen. In, in other words, the Lord is anticipating that they will not respond to the fishes. See that? It says um, they will fish them and after I will send for many hunters and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. For my eyes, and this gives us a bit of a an idea of the context, for my eyes are upon their ways, all their ways, they are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. So uh, Israel has a bit of a reputation for being rebellious against the Lord and uh, the, the return back is no exception. Okay, a quote from John Thomas. Um, you know, how he saw all these things. He said, the truth is there are two stages in the restoration of the Jews, all right? So he, as a Bible student, could see that there's this, these two stages. The first is before the Battle of Armageddon, and that, uh, to use Bible terminology, is the return of Judah, okay, the, the return of Judah, and the second return, the second exodus or the second stage of this return is going to be after Armageddon, and that is the return of Ephraim. Okay, but both of those returns, in other words, before the millennium, the kingdom age formally starts, uh, all the Jews, and I mean all the Jews, will be returned to the land without exception. Uh, that is how definite the prophets are about this. So there we have even John Thomas saw that there were these two distinct periods of uh, migration of the Jews back to the promised land. And biblically, they're called the return of Judah and the return of Ephraim. All right. Just to make it clear, here's Joel chapter 3, another prophecy I'm sure you're familiar with. Okay, um, 
this is a prophecy about the return of the Jews and subsequent Armageddon, the, the gathering of all nations there. But notice this. For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So remember, we're talking about Judah is the first stage. Now, Joel is telling us that it just, just didn't happen by accident. It wasn't a sort of a, a, a coincidence of, of sort of politics or whatever. God was behind the return of the Jews of Judah and Jerusalem. And we know that the return of Judah happened in 1948 and Jerusalem was restored as the capital, in the Jews' eyes anyway, uh, of the nation in when? 67. 67, that's right. Someone's on the ball. Okay. So there we have this um, another definite prophecy. So we're not sort of assuming anything here. We can see that God has been at work in the return of the Jews to the land in the modern times, in living memory for a lot of us. So uh, we can be confident in that according to prophecy, not just assumption. All right, so this is the section of Jeremiah 16 that we're going to look at tonight. Behold, I will send for many fishes, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. All right, it uh, reminds me a little bit about my fishing expertise. Uh, I don't have a lot of luck these days getting a fish to take my bait and come and join me in the boat. It's uh, usually they ignore my enticements on the line. And this is really the principle of the period of the fishes. All right? The principle is this, that really... All the, the bait can be dangled in front of the fish as much as you like, and it can be as attractive as life. But if the fish does not want to take the bait, it can just move on its merry way. And that's in stark contrast to the next stage, as we'll see in class two, God willing. Okay, so uh, this, we should be able to look at history and see a period where Jews could, of their own free will and volition, return to the land. There was an opportunity for them, but there was no um, compelling of them to go back. All right, this period of enticement, as we might like to call it. Okay, and what we, whoops, sorry, what we want to do now is look at the history and see the trends that unfolded over the period of the 1800s particularly and then the early 1900s, and we'll see how things started to give momentum to this idea of the Jews returning to their promised land. So, I'm going to yes. Is that, is that Joel 3 verse 1, is that talking about the, the first return the return of Judah, the second return, the return of Ephraim, or is it uh, applied to both? Uh, Joel 1 is talking about the return of Judah and then Armageddon following straight on from that. Remember John Thomas said Judah comes back, he didn't use that term, but there's a group of Jews come back prior to Armageddon and then a group of Jews will come back after Armageddon. So in, in Joel 3 verse 1, that verse you read out, Yes. Uh, in those days and in that time when I find and bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Yes. What period is that? So that's happened, uh, 1948, 1967. That's the return of Judah. That's, this is the first stage that John Thomas mentioned, the prior to Armageddon stage return of the Jews. And they're called Judah, and we'll see in our second study why they're called Judah. I won't sort of steal too much of the thunder of that section. But uh, you'll, we'll explain that in a little bit more detail. What's the significance of Judah and Ephraim? All right, any other questions? That's great to hear the young people interested there. So don't feel sort of bashful or embarrassed. If you've got questions, by all means. Just a quick question. Jeff. Sure. Uh, is, is there any reason that um, you say this, these fishes uh, like, Hook, line, and sinker kind of fishes as opposed to net fishes? 
Uh, yes, I think it is fishes as far as like the Peter catching the fish with the hook. Um, I don't see it. Well, when you look at the history, you can see there was lots of opportunities trying to entice the men were working very hard in some circumstances to encourage Jews to go back, but it didn't appeal to them and they didn't. And being Jews and knowing their history and their special status in God's plan, they really should have known better. And we'll sort of explore a bit of that as we go through. So, yes, the hook, line and sinker type of fishes, not a net. All right, so it sort of starts in the 1800s. So these, there's two uh, rabbis here and one secular Jew that wrote a bit about uh, the dream of the Jews returning back to the promised land. This is uh, Judah uh, al Kalai. I think that's how you pronounce it. He published, this is right back in the early 1800s, he published uh, certain uh, books or booklets advocating a Jewish hem homeland for Palestine. And this was, in his reckoning, a solution to the pogroms and a pogrom is really a persecution against the Jews, for those who don't know what a pogrom is, where the populace just get a bit annoyed and think they need to vent their frustration, so they take it out on the Jews. And uh, a pogrom is generally associated with Jews. Okay, and there were many of these happening over the years, and uh, this rabbi could see the frustration of the Jewish population throughout Europe that really the answer in his reckoning was to go back to the land. And he published some booklets uh, to, to, to float that idea right back in the early 1800s. So the idea was not a radical thing that Theodore Herzl pulled out of the woodwork at the end of the 1800s, as we'll see. It had been talked about and discussed. And remember, this is hot on the heels of the French Revolution. Now, the French Revolution was a period of nationalism where we're not going to put up with these monarchs. We're going to set up our own state and manage our own state in a democratic way, and we're going to determine our destiny. And all these countries, uh, and particularly in the middle of the 1800s, it was called, when John Thomas wrote Up as Israel, it was called the Year of Revolutions because all these countries were revolting against the status quo and, and breaking away in these, these countries. Um, and the question sort of the Jews were asking, well, what about us? You know, we've been persecuted and we've had to migrate here and there to avoid persecution. What about us going back to the promised land? Isn't that what God wants us to do? These were the thinking Jewish leaders that sort of were starting to uh, promote this idea. Now, this uh, Zvi Hirsch uh, Kalisha, I think that's how you pronounce it, he advocated uh, settlement and self-defence of the Jews. He advocated taking up arms uh, in these pogroms and not just taking it uh, as a lamb to the slaughter. And he also advocated the idea of working the land, all right? And this became a hallmark of Jewish settlement uh, about a century later, that they would come back as agriculturalists, as John Thomas described it, okay? And this was just prior to John Thomas writing Elpis Israel, and these ideas were being floated around, and no doubt John Thomas would have uh, heard about these publications, and then we have this Moses Hess or Moshe Hess. He was a socialist, so a secular Jew. He was contemporary with Karl Marx. And we understand that the Jews were quite taken by the socialist philosophy. In fact, when they settled in, in Israel in 1948, what was a common, or in before 1948, what was a common hallmark of the Jewish settlement in the land? The kibbutzim, that's right which was based on the socialist or communist model. In fact, some, some of the kibbutzim used to have a picture of Stalin up in their dining hall. 
okay. They're obviously a bit um, misconstrued in what Stalin was really up, getting up to, but they idolised that model of socialism. Okay, so uh, Karl Marx and Moses Hess, and there was another one, uh, I forget, they were sort of discussing all the, the models of socialism, communism. So these ideas were in the religious and the secular Jewish societies throughout Europe of returning to the promised land to basically avoid the persecution that they had been suffering over the centuries. All right, another critical ingre ingredient if you're going to start a project like this is money, all right? To, to get a new nation up and running uh, with all the infrastructure, et cetera, that's needed, you need money. And surprisingly enough, the Jews tend to be in, uh, you know, wealthy pursuits such as Lord uh, Edmund Rothschild. He was a banker and many of his family were bankers over the century or so and were able to donate uh, the philanthropists, someone who gives money to a good cause, were able to give um, money to the cause of Jewish settlement prior to 1948, in fact, in the late 1800s. So this uh, Moshe Montefiore, um, he was a British um, member of parliament. There's a funny story of uh, Moshe Montefiore. He's quite a character, apparently. This is a picture of him <coughs> at his 100th birthday. He's looking pretty handsome, isn't he, at 100? It is. That's right. He died, I think, in uh, 1870-something. Yeah. Anyway, um, at his 100th birthday, um, he was a member of parliament. You can you sort of know the pomp that goes on in British situations like that. And uh, this, this um, I forget what his, he was, but this guy came up to him and started, you know, talking to the birthday man and sort of getting conversation going. He said, oh, I've just been to Japan. It's an amazing place. It's so clean. It's a place um, where there's no pigs and there's no Jews. It's just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, and Moshi Montemur said to him, pat him on the back and said, well, my friend, we should visit them next year and they'll have a sample of both. <laughs> 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 so that was the sort of character he was so he was a religious person um and uh morris hirsch he was uh was a secular jew that um again we're talking about money on a scale that is just hard to imagine today they bought uh uh nearly a quarter of a million acres of the promised land in Jezreel and around Jerusalem, a quarter of a million acres, they, these guys book. There were, there were other people that um, worked, but these guys single-handedly donated money and they had other funds set up where they would collect smaller portions from other Jews and uh, not only buy the land but invest in the infrastructure. In fact, the, the windmill outside Jerusalem, the old Dutch-type windmill in West Jerusalem, uh, it was Moses Montefiore that built that as a result of because the Jews needed to try and produce their own food in those days. They were so poor. So these philanthropists um, certainly started to give substance to the idea of going back, and many Jews did start to return during this period, and we'll see why in a little in a slide or two's time okay another fascinating thing that happened during the 1800s was what's known as the christian awakening it's sort of a period they call they sort of try and define us as, as the first and the second and the third awakenings all right so there were the wesley brothers in england back in the 1700s they were the first awakening and uh, they got the Methodist movement going. This is in Britain. And then in America, 
uh, there were the Millerites. Does anyone know what religious group came out of the Millerites? The SDAs, the Seventh-day Adventists, that's right. And then we got uh, Joseph Smith. What group came out of <laughs> the Mormons, the Church of the Latter-day Saints? Uh, we had Alexander Campbell. Uh, he was a man that associated with his John Thomas. This is probably about how old he was at that time, picture of him in the, his younger years um, in America. And then C. Russell, uh, what was his name? It was, um, uh, yeah, sorry. No, I can't think. So this C. Russell, does anyone know what church he started? Yes, they were known as the Russellites. They later changed their name to the Jehovah's Witness. All right. And here, this is actually a Bible camp in America. Uh, does that look familiar? <laughs> what does it look like? Durlock. It does, yeah. Uh, Glenlock. Sorry? Glenlock. Glenlock. Uh, now, Circus. has anyone ever been to Yarrahapne? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this tradition of Bible camps where people would go for a week or a weekend or whatever and study their Bibles and um, they would do all sorts of activities at these things, this came out of this period where people took an active interest in the Bible and discussion around the Bible. And this this fermented a whole heap of uh, passion and, and drive in society, and it was largely centred in Britain and America, coincidentally, Britain and America. Okay. So John Thomas was um, started in America, but he ended up going to Britain. So this religious debate and discussion and the formulation of these religious movements, these modern Protestant movements, um, happened largely in the 1800s. And we'll see the significance of that in a minute, all right, because, uh, in fact, I'll tell you it now. So remember the Balfour Declaration came in the early 1900s uh, through the influence of the Christian Zion movement. And a lot of the members of parliament at that time were Christian Zionists. And that was a result of this period, this discussion and debate. And the common theme, or in fact, I'll put that to you, what was the common theme that these religious people debated and discussed? There's a clue in the Millerites, there's a clue. What did they later become? Yes. No, not the Trinity. The Advent. Okay, so the Adventists. So the discussion around all of this was the feeling that we were getting close to the Advent of Messiah. And when you read your Bible, what do you discover is is an essential ingredient for the Messiah to return? The Jewish people being back in the land. And this was a part of this discussion. And all these groups in their early days acknowledged the need for the Jewish people to return back to the land. Okay, even the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, in the early 1900s abandoned that idea and says, no, we're the witnesses, not the, Je not the Jews. The Jehovah's Witnesses are the witnesses that the Messiah is to come. But in the early days, they all understood this because they discussed the prophecies of the Bible. And as I said, uh, I believe uh, Arthur Balfour's grandmother was involved in this. She was a very devout person. And uh, Lloyd George, and as we'll see, were significant influences in the British Parliament at just the right time. Uncle Jeff, I think it's really interesting. Um, we sort of can take it for granted, but the Bible that I've been translated into English for like 200 years at this point. And that's only five or six generations of families reading the Bible in English. 
And I think that's really interesting. That's pretty quick, actually. And obviously, people who can read Latin or whatever um, could read it before, but if you were reading English, like that's only 200 years of being able to read, if you could read. <laughs> And we're sort of right in the centre of the Industrial Revolution here, so mass printing of the Bible could happen, not just the old Gutenberg where you had to just every page stamp it down. Uh, mass reams of Bibles could be printed and uh, discussion just exploded. Now, this was obviously providential that God was at work here influencing the culture and so of society and the discussion and the focus to... Uh, achieve his outcomes. Uh, as I said, uh, so much, so powerful was this period that it would ultimately influence British foreign policy, as we'll see. Okay, here we go. This is another um, interesting one, the Fiddler on the Roof. Okay. Who's seen the Fiddler on the Roof? Okay, it's the fiftieth anniversary since that was first shown. The um, the um, play or the drama, Bitter on the Roof, this year, nineteen sixty three, was when it was first launched. What's the the plot? What's the story of Bitter <coughs> on the Roof? Jews evicted from Russia, looking for a homeland. What's the what was the place called where they lived? Yes, that's true. There was a fictitious name, but it was the Pale of Settlement, all right, down in the south of Russia, which coincidentally is Ukraine today. Okay, and um, it depicts, you know, uh, an interesting story about Jewish culture and tradition, you know, that famous song, Tradition. Uh, and, you know, a, a, a Jewish father coming to terms with his daughters, not wanting to um, follow tradition. But the backdrop, the setting of it is the persecution, the pogroms of Russia. And it's probably put in a rather lighthearted way for, for Hollywood, but it uh, certainly depicts that story, and this is a pogrom in Kiev, okay, where, and you can see in the background, there's the police, and here's a Jew getting, uh, he's going to be murdered by the mob. You can see they've got their axes and they're taking off, and the police are turning a blind eye to it. This was um, the state of society in Russia, and there are a number of persecutions throughout the Pale of Settlement. Uh, coincidentally, uh, one of the focal points was Odessa. Who's heard of Odessa? Where is Odessa? Hmm? Ukraine. Yes. And if this is key, isn't that Ukraine as well? Yes, it is. That's correct. That's right. So it's interesting that Odessa is in the news again. Uh, being blasted to bits, or it has been, as Russia has taken it over. But they, Odessa was infamous, some 200 plus uh, events of persecution against the Jews in this region. Do you know um, how many Jews were religious Jews and how many were secular Jews? Roughly at this point in history? Uh, no, I don't know the answer to that question. It's such but an interesting intersection because there's so much nationalism and some of it religious and some of it's not. Uh, so the Jews in Russia, although communism hadn't started, but that whole philosophy was taking root in Russia at this stage. Um, so I would hazard to suggest many of them were secular. Uh, now, this was an important part of the process that was unfolding because really it was the Jews from Russia and the Pale of Settlement that did take up the opportunity to go and settle in the Promised Land, okay, because they had nothing to lose, really. This was in stark contrast to the Jews in Western Europe who were largely 
quite successful with their businesses and they had a very high standard of living and therefore Palestine was not an attractive option for them and they just could not do it. But the Jews in um, Eastern Europe and particularly the Pale of Settlement did decide to move down and settle. And those, the, those early aliyahs that ascending up, as aliyah means, were made up of these Jews from Eastern Europe, okay? And they embraced the kibbutz philosophy, the socialist philosophy, and working the land with their hands. You read that period of history, it's quite incredible. Socialism to the point where no one owned anything, we... Everything was equal. No matter what job you did, you got paid the same amount and you worked for the cause of the kibbutz, okay? And it worked well in the early years, but uh, eventually capitalism took over and there's very few kibbutz working in the original traditional model these days, if any. Okay, so these things were happening. We had, um, you know, religious and secular philosophers that were promoting the idea. We had uh, philanthropists that were convinced and prepared to, to donate uh, huge sums of money. There was a Christian movement also uh, that would have a later play in this the part of the puzzle. And then we had uh, this these pogroms, these small sort of local areas of persecution that sort of caused the Jews to leave. And that's depicted in the fiddle of the roof. At the end of the story, the Jews are forced to move on at the order of the Tsar, Tsar Alexander, I think it was, or was it Nicholas? One of the Tsars ordered him, ordered them to move, and they had to pack up their belongings with whatever they could carry and move on. Well, it was this man that really brought it all together. This uh, Theodore Herzl must have been a very persuasive and driven individual. He travelled and travelled um, extensively uh, to promote his idea of Zionism. Okay, you know the story of Theodore Herzl. He was a secular Jew in Austria and he was a journalist and he was uh, covering the Dreyfus case. You heard the Dreyfus case, which was a high-ranking um, officer in the French army who happened to be Jewish, and uh, there was a lot of corruption in the French army at that time, and Dreyfus was used as a scapegoat, and it really polarised French society in with anti-Semitism. And Theodore Herzl was appalled as a journalist reporting on this to the newspapers across Europe at what he saw. And uh, subsequent to his, um, what's it called when you you lose your rank? Demo no, the, in the army when you're court-martialed or whatever it was. Hmm? Uh, yes, he was sacked, basically, humiliated. Uh, yeah. Court martial, yeah. So they ripped his, you know, did a really public display of his um, court martial, ripping off his things, snapping his sword over, you know, and spitting in his face and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but later he was exonerated. Uh, they found that there was um, corruption in the court and uh, he was totally exonerated for what had happened to him. But Theodore Herzl could see through it. And most people with a discerning eye could see that it was just raw anti-Semitism. So Herzl could see that this, this idea of assimilation into European society was never going to work. And really, he wrote his main thesis. Do you remember what his, his book that he wrote was called? The Judenstadt? The Judenstadt? Heard of that name? What's what's that? Jewish state. The Jewish state. Okay, and he promoted this idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. And uh, he he spoke was obviously very influential because you know you get um, 
two Jews in a room and you have three opinions. He was able to galvanise them together uh, and to support this idea of returning to the promised land. And the first Zionist Congress was held in 1897. And, you know, famously he said at the end of that conference, he said, uh, if not in five years, it certainly will be in 50 years, I establish the Jewish state this day. What's 50 years on from 1890, 1897? 1947, which was when the United Nations voted in favour of the petition of the promised land or the Palestine into a Jewish state and a Palestinian state, which the Palestinians rejected. So that's why they still haven't got one today. But 50 years, isn't that incredible? He could see that he had pulled together the momentum of all these things and galvanised them into a focused action, uh, and even he couldn't stop it. It's interesting in 14 years, he was so frustrated, he proposed the idea of going to Uganda. Okay. Now, he was the father of this. He was the one that got it all going. He's driving the train and he says, no, no, we've got to go to Uganda now. And it was bigger than him now. He couldn't stop it. It was really a work of God. This is what you see in these processes that happen and tragically Herzl died um, in his early 40s I think he was and sadly all his children died prematurely as well in tragic circumstances um, but the cause had borne and kept moving uh, right after his death and people like Carm Wiseman and so forth uh, perpetuated it all right, coming into the 19th century, there's the Battle of Beersheba, okay, and it's debated, disputed whether this is an authentic photo, but I think it, I tend to think it is. Uh, one of the reasons is because there's no dust. This is what some people argue, but there had been just a little bit of rain prior to it to settle the dust. So here you've got the three ranks you can see of the Australian light horse, the Anzacs, as they were known. There's New Zealanders and um, Australians. In fact, amongst those men are people from this local area. They're in that photo. A guy from Toronto, Kurenbong, you know, an orange. And these are the guys that successfully... Uh, achieved victory at Beersheba, and as a result, this at this point, the whole course of the war changed. They'd been up at Gallipoli, absolute disaster. In fact, the only successful part of Gallipoli was getting off the island, getting off the peninsula, I should say. They managed to get off without losing a man. Now, that was miraculous. It's almost as if God was saying, no, guys, that's not where you're meant to go. And they managed to get off because, you know, when, it, when there's a rout, and people are retreating, the enemy think, let's get them, and they just smother over the top of them and murder them. Well, they, they didn't do this in this case, and the British were astonished that they got off without losing a man off that peninsula. Uh, such a logistical nightmare it was. Then they went down into Egypt, and they tried to go up through Gaza several times, and again, absolute catastrophe. Thousands of men lost their lives. And then they came up with this radical idea to, to go out into the desert, into the Negev, with horses and men for three days. And they could only carry three days of supplies. I mean, how foolhardy is this really when you think about it? Off they go, 800 men and some 1,200 horses out into the desert with only enough supplies to get you to where you've got to go and then you've got to charge. Now, and if it falls over, it's all over Red Rover. They're going to perish. And significantly, the battle is called the Battle of Beersheba. Does anyone know what Beersheba means? 
the yes, the wells of the oath, the wells of the covenant, the wells, and it really was a battle for the wells for these people to survive. Um, and to this is a real nail biter. This one, you're sitting on the edge of your seat. What happened was they got out there, and the diversionary tactic by the British over on the west of Beersheba started and they're bombing the Turks and all the Turks are drawn over to the west. And But before they could charge, they had to just clear up this little knoll called uh, Tel Saba, the Tel of Sheba. Tel is a mound. There was a little garrison of Turks there and they had to clean up this little Tel before they could charge because these guys would have been, you know, the Gatlin guns would have been a disaster. And they planned that they needed 12 hours minimum to take Beersheba and they sent out a little commando raids of New Zealanders and Aussies to take Tel Sheba. And uh, by 9 o'clock, you know, they started at 4 o'clock in the morning, they're bombing the British are doing their diversion over here. And they go up and try and take this by 10 o'clock. They still hadn't managed to take the tell. 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the tell finally fell to the, to the uh, Allies. These guys have been three days... They've got no supplies, exhausted supplies. They've got an hour of daylight left. Can you see the suspense that, that's going on here? An hour of daylight, an hour to take it. No one would have dreamt it was possible. They said that you at least need 12 hours battle, you know, in good conditions to push the Turks and the Germans out. And uh, anyway, they're saying, well, what are we going to do? And... When you're in that situation, what can you do except go ahead? If you stay there, you're going to perish. So off they went. And um, Chevelle was uh, given the option to have the Australians lead the charge. Now, this is guys from New South Wales and Victoria that led this charge from a nobody nation. This is an interesting take too. You know, God's using the despised people that untested to uh, achieve this goal, and they came in, and within three quarters of an hour, they took Beersheba and saved the wells without losing hardly anyone. Jeff, wasn't there some issue with the wells being mined? They, they were. That's they correct. Yeah, You've so seen the movie, haven't you? Uh, sort of some clip. Yeah, no, not the movie, but some document. How did they work around that? Uh, so, what the Aussies did here on this occasion was so. The light horse, the tactic was the, the horse, they weren't a cavalry, they were simply a fast way of moving troops around the battlefield. So they would gallop over to here, they would all dismount, and then they would get down with their guns and start fighting. And the, a couple of the strappers would take the horses into a gully and, and hide them. And then uh, if they needed to move again, they'd all come back to the horses and they'd gallop around over there, they'd get off, dismount, and the Turks cottoned on to this and they say, just wait till they dismount and then we'll shoot them because, uh, you know, it's too hard to shoot them riding. So, but the Aussies didn't do this this time. They, typical Australians, improvised and they didn't have any swords. So they took their bayonets off their rifles and they used their bayonets as swords and they galloped. This is, this is uh, four miles they gallop this charge. You can see the guys off in the distance there. Four miles. And, uh, I mean, how long is the Melbourne Cup? You know, no. These little... <laughs> Did you get the right horse this year, though, Jamin? Or last year, sorry. Anyway, okay, the, this is incredible that they managed to get that far with these little Brumby horses. Um and they got there and took the Beersheba in, in less than an hour, basically, and managed to find the German control centre for the mines that were going to blow up the wells and disconnected the wire and uh, were able to water. Now, 
1,200 horses, you, you sort of understand the logistics of watering 800 men and horses. You can't just sort of line up at the tap. You know, you've got to, this, they, they've got to build the troughs and line the horses up. It was just the logistics of just securing the place was incredible. In fact, most people who know the history say it was a miracle. No one would have ever believed it could have been done. Such a foolhardy idea to go off into the desert at such high risk, such high stakes, and they managed to pull it off and achieve it. And Beersheba was taken. And I could turn, you could probably put, in fact, we just did it in our readings recently, um, Genesis 46. You remember when Jacob goes down into Egypt to, with, to meet Joseph? I don't know if you're following the readings, but if you are, the story goes that Joseph was, go oh, sorry, Jacob is going down into Egypt and uh, he builds an altar at Beersheba, coincidentally. Remember the story? And God appears to him. This is the last time God appeared to Jacob in a vision as he's going down into Egypt, or at least it's recorded anyway in the Bible. He goes down and God says, don't worry to go down into Egypt. I'll make you a great nation down there. And I will bring your children back again. I'll bring your offspring. I will bring Jacob back. At Beersheba, it was said, as Jacob is leaving the land, God said to him, made the promise of Solomon, surely I will bring you back. All right? This is incredible language. That's Genesis 46, verses 1 to 4, if you want to have a look at it. It also brings in Daniel 11 too, doesn't it? The king of the south pushing that. Yeah. Correct. That's right. Okay, so Just yeah. Uh, did you think about the quantity of water? Eight hundred men per day. Eight hundred men, twelve hundred horses. Have you you've got some volumes. Uh, more than ten thousand liters. Yeah. Uh, well, how are they going to carry that around? You know what I mean? Where are they going to get it from? So they had dug a few little wells to supply them as they went, but they couldn't stay there. They had to move on. So. That's how they managed to uh, to get round there, and they all this subterfuge that had happened for weeks as they prepared for this battle. It's a fascinating story, and uh, miraculously, having failed in a naval attack on Constantinople, absolute disaster <laughs> of Gallipoli. Then trying to take, you know, in really in hindsight, you think, well, surely just marching up through Gaza would be the same thing as. They'd take Palestine, wouldn't they? But no, God wanted them clearly to come through Beersheba because of its significance. And to a Jew who knew his Bible well would know that there's significance attached to, to Beersheba, and that's just one passage. So are you saying it's a part of the Fisher? Period. Period. And you'll see why in this next slide. Because guess what happened at exactly the same time? When the, the, the Aussies are barreling down on Beersheba, the British Parliament is sitting and approving this document, and it was issued two days later. Now, that wasn't by design. They, the British didn't sort of get it all together. and It was just coincidence. In fact, the Parliament had been debating this document for some six months, and the stubborn members of Parliament were trying to change it who coincidentally were Jewish, were wanting to water it down and water it down and it went back and forth and back and forth and it was really um, through the persistence of these Christian Zionists that were in Parliament at the time that it ever got anywhere at all. And coincidentally it was approved the very day that Beersheba was being taken and that as soon as the dust settled from that they issued the declaration where they support the return of Jewish migration back to the promised land. Now if a Jew was watching this who knew the, the significance of this he'd say I think providentially something is happening here. The British government the superpower of the world that had won the war, or was winning the war, I should say, um, but at this point, is supporting us. This, there's nothing like this until you go back to the Persian Empire when Cyrus made the decree. This is the parallel that we're talking about here. 
And to the Jews, this should have been quite plain. In fact, the Jewish people, every Sabbath, what do they finish their Sabbath meal with? Next year in Jerusalem. Every family who keeps the Sabbath says that. Next year in Jerusalem. Do you think, why do they say that? What connection did they have with that concept? They knew that that was the promise of, the, of their forefathers to eventually one day they would be taken back to the promised land. And here was an opportunity and really they failed to take that up. Okay, here's a few interesting chaps. Do we know who these men are? You probably know who this guy is. Who's he? Balfour. Balfour. Arthur Balfour. He was the foreign secretary at this time, and he's the one that the declaration is named after, Arthur Balfour. Now, who's this guy? He's a little bit more strange. Anyone know who he is? He happened to be the prime minister, Lloyd George. Again, these are people who, uh, particularly Arthur Balfour, he was a very religious man. Um, Lloyd George was probably more a politician, and uh, but he used Christian Zionism, Zionism as a platform when it suited him. All right, so the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary pushed this idea of um, the Balfour Declaration, and they finally got it passed by Parliament, uh, even though, ironically, it was Jews that opposed the idea in as British Jews, as members of Parliament, that debated against it. And here's the, the irony of this predicament. The argument they had against the, the issuing of the Balfour Declaration was uh, these were British Jews and they said, there's no way I'm going to go back to a ghetto in Palestine and live down there. I'm a British citizen. This is where I'm born and bred and where I'm staying. Move back down there to the ghetto. I mean, how powerful are those words? In a few decades, they would become, you know, uh, corralled into the ghettos of Europe for not going down there. All right, and this final guy, does anyone know who he is? That's a good guess, but no, it's not right, Phil, sorry. It's Herbert Samuel. All right, notice that name, Herbert Samuel. Now, he is a member of Parliament as well, and the name gives it away. He's Jewish. Jewish. Now, he, you'll see him in this garment here. Uh, this is what he wore when he went to Palestine. He became the first High Commissioner of Palestine. In other words, the, the main CEO, the, the chief executive officer of the mandate of Palestine. And he's a Jew. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Here is a foreign military power that, in fact, were the victors of World War I. They've deliberately chosen to put a Jew in charge and they've made a public declaration to say, we support Jews returning to the promised land. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Okay, and uh, he took up his office. You know, when he walked, he arrived at Haifa and then he came down to Jerusalem and they gave him this royal welcome as he came to Jerusalem. People were in tears as he walked in this white suit down into Jerusalem and they said it was like the Messiah had returned. They felt it was that powerful. All right, so all these things had happened after World War II. This is Jewish, uh, July 1920. The British mandate was approved by the League of Nations. Okay. Now, does anyone know? Yes. Haven't got it there. Who this fellow is? Karl Weizmann. That's right. Now, he was the president of the World Zionist Organization, and he gave a speech at 
the exact same time as this guy was taking up office in Palestine. And this was the title of his speech at the World Zionist Organization in 1920, June. Jewish people, where are you? See, he was, he was a, a staunch advocate for the Jewish people to return and he would work uh, tirelessly even up through and after World War II for the Jews to return to the land. But he could see that this was the golden opportunity for them to come back. And he was just flabbergasted. He could not understand why they wouldn't go back. Jewish people, where are you? What are you thinking? was the tone of his speech. Well, it became even more formalised. The League of Nations in the San Remo Conference in April 1920 approved the British mandate. So this was the League of Nations. The international body was now approving the British oversight of the land of Palestine and that British nation had made the statement where they support the Jews returning. So it was now enshrined in international law. Um, and interestingly enough, um, in 1922, they sort of amended this British mandate article with this Article 4, and they said, look at this, an appropriate Jewish agency shall be recognised as a public body for the purpose of advising and cooperating with the administration of Palestine in such economic, social and other matters as may affect the establishment of the Jewish national home and the interest of the Jewish population in Palestine. So the League of Nations, having approved the British mandate, added this extra clause that they want a Jewish agency set up to facilitate the settlement of Jews as well under the British, right, and uh, to assist and take part in the development of the country. Now this, let's call it a governing organ, all right? That's a very... Uh, reasonable way to describe this committee. It was the organ of government for the Jewish people under the British mandate. Now, this was miraculous when you think about it. What was really happening, it was like an embryo was forming in the womb of the British mandate because this committee went on to become the government of the modern state of Israel. Ben-Gurion and all the others that were associated with him were members on this committee and they learned the practice of how to govern a country by being under the British. What does that remind you of in terms of Bible prophecy? Us. Yes, yeah, it's, um, this is a pretty, pretty out there question, right? But I, the clue is in this organ of yeah, government. Hmm? Yeah, mine, yes, cars. yes, I guess that's true. What it made me think of, right, this is the resurrection of a body, right, as Ezekiel 37 describes it. And here we have the brain the organ of government being developed and gradually put together by the divine hand as, you know, and, and Ezekiel 37, as we'll see next class, God willing, intimately describes piece by piece as this body is being rebuilt. And here is the thinking, the governance of this body that was being put back together. They were in control of the culture and language, the medical um supervision and oversight of the Jewish education, defence, purchase of land, youth affairs, public works, culture, the development of rural settlements, all these things the Jewish agency took. They, they were the government, the fledgling government in embryonic state under the Jewish 
uh, under the British mandate. And the question should be asked, well, why didn't the Jews see it? Why didn't they go back? Surely, you'd think. All these things, you know, Carm Wiseman could see it and other prominent Jews, religious Jews particularly, could see it. Well, the answer is here. And this is a quote from Yigal Lossin, who wrote The Pillar of Fire, which is a very seminal work on this period. He, uh, it, was, it was originally a TV documentary, but it became published as a book as well. And he said, the Jewish people did not hasten to grasp this historic opportunity for mass migration during the period of the 20s. And that picture gives you insight as to why. Would you like to guess why they didn't go? Exactly. It was not an attractive proposition to give up this lifestyle and go and live as agriculturalists in the diseased, desert-ridden land of Palestine. It did not appeal to the Jewish people in Western Europe particularly at all. There was no way they were going to sacrifice this lifestyle. And sadly, as Carm Wiseman despaired, the Jewish migration during this period hardly measured a blip when this momentous opportunity was there. So this was the period of the fishers. And uh, next class, God willing, we'll look at the period of the hunters where gods would drive, send many hunters, and they shall hunt them methodically from every mountain, from every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks.